Hello everybody, I am Spanish Grand Master Pepe Cuenca and I'm pretty sure that many of you that are watching this video uh, like art of music and the feelings uh, that you get when entering in a museum and observing a Picasso picture or when listening a, a piece of Mozart of uh, Beethoven is indescribable, right? It's something that it's amazing or awesome. Well, for those who like chess, uh, for those who follow chess every day, this chess game uh, is gonna produce you the same uh, kind of feelings. This is uh, the Evergreen game, is one of the most famous games in, uh, in the history of chess and it was played between Andersen and Dufresne. Who is Andersen? Uh, some of you will be asking to me, Pepe, who is Andersen? I don't know, Andersen. Well, Andersen uh, was uh, one of the best uh, chess players in the world in uh, the 50s and the 60s in the 19th uh, century. He was a mathematician, he was, uh, his, his, his job was teaching mathematics, but his main hobby was chess. And after uh, beating, uh, and after winning some tournaments in, in, in those years, he was considered to be uh, one of the best chess players in the world, if not the best. Um, he was born in, in Breslau, in uh, the current uh, Bronklav, and uh, this was part of the, of the Prussian Empire. And this game was placed in uh, was played sorry in 1852, and uh, yeah, let's just cut the, the bullshit and then uh, see what happened in the 64 squares in the Evergreen game, one of the most famous and beautiful games in the history of chess. So Andersen played e4, and uh, Dufresne replied with e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop c4, the Italian opening. Uh, as you guys know, uh, it's also possible to play bishop b5 here, and this is the Spanish Re Lopez opening, or d4, the scotch, right? So many, many possibilities. So bishop c4, putting the bishop in one of the best uh, diagonals so far, attacking the, the weakest uh, pawn of black, the f7 pawn, Facundo, and black replies by doing the same thing. So nowadays, in top tournaments, uh, people play d3, or short castle, or c3, right? But in the game, uh, Andersen played b4. This is uh, what we call um, the Evans uh, Gambit, right? And uh, Andersen was known uh, because of his aggressive style and he was a player who used to sacrifice a lot of stuff in the, in the games. And he produced two immortal games, one in 1851 and the other one, this one in 1852. So the idea of, of this before, of course, is uh, first, uh, black takes a pawn, and now what's the idea? What could ask? Well, I just lost a pawn and for nothing? Well, the idea is to play c3, and then you gain uh, a fast control in the center. You're gonna install a beautiful center with your pawns on, on, on c3 and d4. This joined by the fact that this queen can come to b3 and uh, attack uh, very aggressively the pawn on f7, and this diagonal will be used by the bishop on c1, then this gives uh, white an amazing counter play and this could be very very dangerous for black players if you guys don't know what to do here in the opening with black even more dangerous than uh, donald trump fighting for the uh, climate change so just try to to know something if you play e5 with black against this this opening well here there are many many options for example well not so many but for bishop a5 is one of the mess, uh, main lines and the other one is bishop e7 this particularly uh, i i like very much. The idea is after d4 you want to play knight a5 and then again you could ask me Pepe what's the point I'm just losing my pawn on e5. Well this is precisely the idea. You get this, uh, you give this pawn back to, to white and in return you capture one of the uh, most uh, dangerous pieces uh, for white this bishop on c4 and after knight c4 you can play d5 reaction in the center and you get a really healthy position since you got the bishop pair and soon you're gonna go knight f6 on short castle. In the game, uh, Dufresne played bishop a5. The idea of this move is uh, rather simple again. After d4, you wanna take on d4 and then you prevent white from taking on d4 with the pawn and from, uh, you prevent uh, white from installing this beautiful center with c takes d4. So uh, e takes d4 was played by Dufresne and now short castle. Now, you, of course, you are threatening to go c takes d4, right? So black has uh, several options in this in this moment. You can go knight e7 in order to react uh, against uh, c takes d4 with d5. You can go d6. And uh, another move that was played in the game is quite interesting is d3. 
giving this pawn back, but of course the idea is uh, you prevent this, uh, uh, you prevent uh, the opening of this uh, beautiful diagonal for right, right? Like imagine some bishop here on b2 attacking g7 could be extremely dangerous if, if you got if you got these two guys here attacking black skin, and also the c file is gonna be closed and. Uh, C takes E4 is not uh, longer an option, right? So that's why D3 is, is so interesting. But here, Anderson says, okay, I pass. I don't want this pawn on D3. I just want to give you checkmate on F7. I want to take Facundo that everybody told me is so damn tasty, right? So Bishop, uh, Queen B3, and now Black has to defend F7, right? Knight H6 is not possible since Bishop A8-6 just wins a game. So you've got to move the Queen defending F7, right? So the Fresno played Queen F6, one of the most natural moves here in the position, and now deviation theme. You play E5, and if Black takes on E5, you can always take and then take on F7, destroying uh, Black's possibilities of uh, putting his uh, his skin in a safe place, right? Or uh, and also the E file is open, so this could be a disaster for Black actually. So that's why you got to move the queen to a square where you keep defending the F7 pawn, right? That's why the Fresno played Queen G6. And now uh, this position has been reached even in nowadays and people have been playing uh, rook d1 in order to capture this pawn on d3. But Anderson played rook e1, another natural move defending e5 and now preparing for developing his minor pieces, let's say bishop a3, knight bd2 and then continue attacking the black's king. Of course, if black manages to, to put his king in a safe place, let's say knight g7, short castle, d6, bring the bishop out, then it will be much, much better since he's a pawn up, right? He's two pawns up, but the pawn on d3 is going to fall for sure. Anyway. Black played knight g to e7 and now bishop a3, putting this bishop in another beautiful diagonal where it uh, could cause uh, black a lot of trouble, right? And here it was the moment for black to go short castle. This was the best move according to the engines, to the, to the engines that we're using nowadays, right? And maybe he was afraid of some rook e3 and then bishop takes d3 and of course the compensation is quite big in here in this position for white. But anyway, short castle was the best move. Dufresne played in a really uh, in a really interesting style, like uh, trying to to get his pieces uh, active, and he played b5. He was pretty scared of these two guys looking at Facundo, and uh, yes, that's why he uh, gives a pawn back to to White, and in return he will get some uh, tempi and also the b file for the rook. Of course, here yeah, it's, it's best to take with the queen. You take with the bishop, rook b5 makes uh, a lot of sense, and now a6 is a huge threat, right? So after b5, queen takes b5 was uh, played by Anderson, and rook b8, and here you got only one square, so don't go to... Well, you got c5 as well, but then this queen can be attacked easily by bishop b6, right? So you cannot go to d5 or a6, whatever. You cannot take on b8, right? Don't be that greedy. Then this knight is defending the queen and, and the, the rook, sorry, and you lose the game on the spot. So you've got to go to a4, and now bishop b6. Why bishop b6? Uh, some of you could be asking. Well, you want to go short castle, right? But the problem is after short castle, bishop takes e7, knight takes e7, and the bishop now faith on a5 is hanging, right? So that would be for me. So that's why bishop b6 was played by Dufresne, Dufresne sorry, and now knight bd2. White has managed to uh, develop all, all his, his minor pieces, right? And there are many plans now, for example, like knight e4, and then there are some tasty squares on d6 and f6, and you're gonna see uh, uh, that for now the game becomes extremely, extremely complicated. So black plays bishop b7. Now uh, he, he's got also two monsters here, right? Like attacking f2, this bishop looking at f3, this queen looking with x-rays as well, uh, with uh, to g2, right? And then, of course, the position could be very, very dangerous for, for white as well. But still, this king in the center. And Anderson tries to make, uh, to make use of it. And he plays knight e4. And now the position becomes extremely hard to play for, for black, right? The problem after short castle is that you just simply can't take the, the pawn on d3 and then look at this queen. It's gonna have a lot of trouble. For example, let's say queen h6, the threat was knight f6, right? And now this bishop can come back to c1 to ask some question to this queen, right? So queen h5 and now knight g3, and look at that queen. Uh, this queen, uh, that queen 
uh, hasn't got any space, right? Hasn't got any square to move. Every square is completely covered um, by uh, white pieces, so the queen is lost. So that's why he didn't want to go short castle, and he went in queen f5 in order to attack e5 maybe. And uh, but now from at this point, from this point, uh, Anderson plays really in a brilliant style. He goes bishop d3. Now the threat is knight d6 or knight f6, queen h5. And here, then Jin suggests uh, that you just play very calm with knight g3, queen h6, and rook a d1. And there are so many threats, even bishop c1. And the position is completely uh, winning for white. But instead, Andersen playing, uh, plays in his style, play, plays knight f6. A really interesting move. Then Jin doesn't agree with us, but you have to 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 to... To, to take in account that this game is played in the 19th century, even though he's one of the best uh, players in the world, uh, still uh, the Jin doesn't agree. And we have to uh, try to explain why, right? So G takes F6, now E takes F6, and now what Black uh, gains a lot of contemplate on the G file. Look at this uh, rook on G8, how it's looking at this king with beautiful eyes. Then there are many, many threats. Then uh, queen f3 is a threat, and the thing is, you cannot capture on e7 with a check, it looks like, right? Because after f takes e7, then queen f3, and after rook takes uh, e7, just uh, knight takes e7, and the king is uh, protected by the own white pieces, right? That doesn't allow to bring another piece to with a check, right? But at this point, Anderson plays one of the most beautiful, beautiful, sorry, prophylactic moves that I've ever seen in, in my life, right? He plays the move rook a d1. And one could ask again, Pepe, I don't understand any shit. I don't understand anything. What's the problem if black takes on f3? Well, you are gonna see the idea behind this rook a d1. The move that saves the game for black, according to the gene, is the crazy queen a3. The point is here, you are defending d7. As you are gonna see later, this is gonna be the key of the position. So here, black, white would be forced to play bishop f1. You play g3, then just rook g3 is a huge baboom, right? Since uh, there is a pin here in this diagonal. So you're forced to play bishop f1 and then queen f5 and the position is balanced according to the game, even though it's damn crazy, right? But the point is, after rook a d1, if black plays queen a3 as Dufresne did in the game, then you're gonna see one of the best combinations ever and you're gonna see why this chess game is art. Of course now, Black uh, has many, many threats in this position. He is threatening to take on F2, he's threatening to take on G2. If you play G3, he will boom you in G3 with the Rook. And you have to play uh, with checks now or you are dead with White. And here Anderson played Rook E7 check. And the point is, what can I do after knight takes e7? Because I'm threatening on g2 again there. I'm threatening like 27 different kind of checkmates in this position with black. Here you go. F e7 is not possible. Bishop e7 is not possible. The move is queen d7. One of the best uh, combinations that uh, one can see in chess. That's why this will be uh, one of the... Uh, games that will be remembered forever, right? And the thing is, you cannot mm, go king f8 since bishop e7 is checkmate or queen e7 is checkmate. You have to take the queen and now what's going on here? This rook is also uh, attacked by the queen. What are you gonna do here in this position? Well, there's bishop f5 with a double check to the king. You cannot take this bishop since there is a check with the rook. You cannot take this rook since there is a check with the bishop. So uh, uh, accordingly, you have to move the queen. And there are two only possible squares here for the queen. Sorry, the king. You can go to c6 and you can go to e8. If you go to c6, then bishop d7 is a checkmate, a beautiful geometrical uh, checkmate, right? And if you go to e8, as happened in the game, as it happened in the game, you play bishop d7 anyway, and it doesn't matter where you move the queen to d8 or f8, that's gonna be a checkmate. To Fresno played king f8 and then bishop e7, checkmate. So uh, Anderson sacrificed a piece, then a rook, then a queen. One of the best uh, games in history of chess. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This has been Pepe Cuenca for Chess24. Just uh, have a nice day. See you in the next videos. Bye bye. Bye bye, mi piccolissima dama.